Okay, we're going to continue procedural terrain. And to do that, I'm going to dive once more into the force graph. So we're just on force graph right now. In the last video on force graph, I introduced it and gave you kind of a visualizer and a processor all combined into one. Now I've split this out. This means that we can now take this force graph code and easily import it into just about anything else, as this is a different project right now than the actual terrain tests. Okay, so let's dive into what some of these changes are at the visual level and then go into the code. All right, so, and again, the source code for this is all available on GitHub. The link is down below in the description. Okay, so to begin with, if I click this button, the, the checkbox, just like before, it processes and executes. Now, I'm going to say, let's set this to a 7,000 or 70,000, whatever. I execute this. I'm going to clear this out as well. Um, you can see it's processing, and it's, it's pretty comfortable. It's not moving, maybe a little bit. It's still, yeah, there's still tiny movements, but they're almost imperceptible because this is pretty comfortable. Now, it's still probably processing, so I'm going to click Stop. Now, Force Graph ran 9,172 steps before a forced stop. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to execute this again, but I want to click that sooner. I want to see where we got to. There, that seemed good. That seemed good. That seemed good. That seemed good. Okay, so what are we seeing? We're seeing uh, between 759 to 1,000, or 575 to 1,000. So I'm just going to put 1,000 iterations. All right, now when I run this, we give it 1,000 iterations, and that seems pretty comfortable. Um, this is a debug tool right here to kind of say, what was that stop point? And when we click stop, what time was it? Now, it's a little bit uncomfortable. Honestly, a hotkey would probably work better here, uh, just because of the fact that once I click this one, I have to take my eyes away from the map and then click the stop button. That is a little bit difficult to align it. Um, if you're comfortable enough with the mouse, you can do that, but that's not the best step. Anyway, but I didn't want to take hotkeys if I don't have to, because this really is a designer tool right now. Okay, so, but it, that's to give us an idea. We can reduce it and then run this again. Now, another thing, this is giving us an iteration time. The iteration time, like, let's say that I set this to 200 and run it. Well, that means there are 200 of these, and then upwards of uh, six, so upwards of 12 connections per node. So most of the more heavily connected ones are going to find their way to the center, and the least connected ones will should find their way to the outside. Okay, now that's also telling us that we're seeing between 15 and 16 milliseconds that it executes, most of the time around 15. Now that's also on my machine. This is valuable to know. Now 15 is something I should be able to run live on a client machine, and it looks like we've already finished now. Um, I'm going to click stop just in case, and it ran for 1,001 steps. So technically, it's got that last counter that it adds onto it, and it recognizes that difference. Or we're at negative one for how many iterations we've got uh, have left. So when it's subtracted, we got 1,001 instead of 1,000. Technically, uh, it'll only give us that one over at the end. OK, so uh, anyway, we've applied this. Now there's something else. Instead of just doing it step by step, we can also do all of it in one shot. Just execute the whole thing in one frame, and the move or the, the force graph script actually takes care of that on its own. Okay, so if I hit check, then it just executes this and runs it according to the values I gave it, and I can see the final results. I don't get to see all the steps along the way. That takes time. It takes like two seconds to two or three seconds to execute through a thousand iterations of this particular setup on my machine. Um, but the information that I'm giving back, like so, once I click stop how many steps the force graph ran, and when I, and also how much time it runs per frame. So in this case, I executed all of it in one frame. It took 106 milliseconds. That's a little more expensive. That tells me that this might be a higher number than what I will actually want to execute. Now, this also has nothing in the code right now for any kind of uh, um, 
I'm forgetting the term for it, uh, threads. So we don't have any threading involved right now. We're not using the dot system, um, dots or threading or j jobs, the job system. Um, jobs or threading, those could both help out in this. Um, additionally, this code could also be done so you execute a certain number of steps, a certain number of steps uh, per coroutine and basically put on a, a stopwatch or a timer and evaluate how much time has passed there. And if more than 15 milliseconds have passed, then move on to the next frame. So, and then the coroutine continues where it was. That's a step to allow more processing time and allow the frame rate to continue to keep up. Okay, uh, another thing that's in here is scaling. If I add scaling, I'm now changing the size of this. In addition to that, I can also change its offsets. Uh, so I can change its uh, X and Y coordinate for up and down. I can also change its Z for closer or farther from the camera. Um, of course, I don't actually want to change those. Um, but this gives us the ability to effectively set where in the world it's going to show up. That means that I could take this and have it overlay on top of the terrain itself or on top of a 2D map or whatever system we have or a 3D planet, whatever structure we want. Okay. So that gives us the settings here or the ability to, to configure all of our settings and execute this. Um, the next thing that I want to do is start going into the code changes that I put in place to execute this. So first of all, uh, let's go over into Forcegraph. And not Forcegraph Manager, but Forcegraph itself, because I've split out most all the functionality. Now, a lot of this is a repeat of exactly the code that was inside of Forcegraph Manager last time. So if I scroll down, we see Apply Push and Pull. And these are pretty much the exact same thing as they were before. There's a difference. I used to use time.delta time in this. Now I'm using frame time. Um, because of the fact the frame time, the amount of processing time it took to operate a single step is important in our evaluation of this, uh, it's it, we're keeping that same value as we move forward for the processing. And it is a declared time. It is not getting it from delta time. That way, we can actually guarantee that we get the same format of the equation. We don't all of a sudden find on a slower machine that it takes one second to step through uh, a, a one step of this. Um, and so our suddenly our frame time goes from 0.015 to uh, uh, 1 in our multiplication because that would become hugely jittery. Um, wildly inaccurate to our design and interest of what this would turn out to be. Okay, so we apply the push, we apply the pull, everything else here is the same. Um, when we're going through each of the results, same thing. We're going through all of the nodes and we're effectively checking the connected nodes and applying our pushes and pulls. And instead of vector three zero, it is now anchor position, which we are setting external to this, to vector 3.0. Okay. So that's our single step execution. That before used to be called apply force. You'll notice, maybe you'll notice, but there used to be in here something to check the iteration steps to see how many were remaining. That's no longer there. This does not keep track when you're doing step-by-step -step executions anymore. Uh, what I do have in here is full execution. Full execution takes uh, it basically just goes for every single one of these for the iterations and just executes them all in one pass. And once this function ends, it's done. Now, again, I could produce this as a coroutine with a time cap on it that if a step ever takes longer, including having the single step being a coroutine, that as it gets from di right after each pull and push, it does another check to see if the time ha if it's passed too much time and then returns it right away uh, to continue on later uh, in the next frame. That way, every single one of these has a chance to slow it down. Now, even without that, applying the push and pull, um, each one of these, actually that's pretty straightforward. Um, we get the positions, we apply it, we're doing this per position, so this would be pretty light to do it here. I guess for every node, once we finished a node, we could check that and do it again. We don't necessarily need it for each uh, push and pull. 
Okay. Um, so that's a single step. And then execute full, that was the whole thing. And then finally we just have a its own public class node. Uh, I no longer have a separate node class. Um, we hold on to a list of connected nodes. Uh, we have an object for external details. That's not currently used right now in the visualizer. Uh, the key point to it is that when you generate the, when you pass in these items into here and you give them their initial connections uh, and their uh, whatever starting points they're going to have, that you can also apply that that relates to this game object or to this potential thing, whatever information you want to give. That way, when it comes back out, you can just go to this external object, cast it back to the type it was, and you can get that this was a base marker. This is where an item goes. This is where whatever. You get your information back out. Okay, uh, and then of course frame time. Right now I have it set to 1 60th of a second. So if we execute this, uh, we could just skip time.delta time and we never have to actually pass it in. Um, but I'm getting real numbers out of this, so I have the visualizer passing in the real delta time right now. Okay, so let's step through here, uh, go back to force graph now, or the force graph manager. This is maybe more accurate to call it force graph visualizer. Uh, but let's dive into the code just a little bit further. So here we have visual configuration. These are all the items that change it manually or control it. Um, nothing particularly new there. Uh, same thing for force graph. We've just put the variables into the places that they need. We no longer have a list of nodes in here. Instead, we have a reference to our force graph um, and still have our private iterations remaining. On validate, we are just taking any changes that we've made and we push them into the force graph script right away. So any continued processing on it gets those changes. Uh, we also have the stop, which is effectively stopping any iterations remaining. Um, if it is a larger execution, it never that that larger execution right now does not hand off processing. It doesn't. It's not a coroutine. It doesn't hand that information back. Okay. Oh, but a key callout on this, this is not a mono behavior. This is just a basic .NET class that just happens to know about Vector3. If you wanted to make this available for a non-Unity project, you could effectively just create a new Vector3 class yourself or struct yourself. Okay. Uh, force graph. Uh, so, yeah, that's our force graph, our on validate, how we stop. Um, instantiate nodes is basically the same. We just tell the force graph to clear out its list of nodes because that's all it needs. Uh, we add the new nodes, again, no game objects this time, uh, and we just set the positions directly when we're creating them there. Um, next, we apply random nodes, and this is effectively the exact same code, code again. It's just not related to a game object directly. Okay. Next, we have on giz draw gizmos, which is the exact same as before with one thing. Scaling and offset is applied here. So we apply the scaling and offset to this to see what those results are. Um, there is a normalization factor that I intend to add to this uh, that I'll get to in a, in a later video, possibly the next one. Okay, but right now this doesn't include normal, the normalization of the force graph data. <clears throat> Okay, but yeah, everything is drawing for those node, node positions or the anchor position, uh, which right now is just offset or vector 3.0 if there is no offset. Then we do the update. So in the update, we're doing our check here to see, do we need to instantiate new uh, items? Uh, do we have any items remaining? If we have no items remaining, do nothing. Otherwise, we're putting in a stopwatch. So a stopwatch is just a standard .NET feature that you can use to get, um, it, it's part of, uh, what was it, diagnostics? Um, System.diagnostics. Okay, now system.diagnostics also has a debug class, so that can get confusing with calling things like debug log. And when I was calling debug log earlier, you may have noticed that I included unity engine.debug.log because I have the system.diagnostics namespace in here. So it gets confused if I don't call it out. All right, um, so the update continues. Uh, we have our duration, our stopwatch, and we effectively just start it. We run our executions, 
and then we stop it and we have the iteration time, that debug field. So if it's marked as instant, it will just immediately set the remaining iterations to zero because if we have uh, instanti if we instantiated the nodes, remember that sets the uh, how many iterations are remaining there. It might actually be better just to set that here instead of inside of that object inside of that function. Okay, then uh, so it's either going to do a full execution or it's going to do a single step execution. If it's a full execution, it sets the value to negative one. If it's uh, the single step execution, it subtracts one. And that's really the only difference. That's the new code, that's it. The biggest value here is this force graph and the fact that it's fairly lightweight. This is about as lightweight as we can get. Now, we could be doing things instead of by doing distances uh, or normalized, um, we could be doing magnitudes um, which do I have distance in here? Yeah, so we're we're basically still doing normalization. We're doing uh, some normalization. <laughs> this is just for direction. Um, we are not actually getting a normalized value for how much everything else moves. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's our core changes. This class is now something that we can apply somewhere else very easily, um, which. Prob probably will be the next course or the next video if I don't do normalization first. Okay, I hope you'll find this useful and something that maybe you can just grab this code and start applying it and add it to your own project. Now, I did put this under the MIT license, so I believe attribution is one of the things on it so to at least include where you got the code from. Uh, but aside from that, you're free to just use this inside of your own projects as is, whatever. Okay. Good luck. Let me know if you have any questions and any ideas for some of the future videos on this and what I cover. Thanks.